Kia ora, Nisan Bola, Talofalava. Uh, warm Pacific greetings to our Pacific viewers. Uh, good day to our Australian friends and family, uh, and welcome, uh, one and all. My name is Jose Thomas. I'm a strength and conditioning coach based out of uh, Melbourne, Victoria. Uh, I've been doing a bit of community work with the local rugby club Harlequins. I've just been appointed chair of welfare. Um, and also uh, working alongside the Vic Masters Tight Five um, and doing a little bit of schoolboy rugby at the same time as running, as running my business. I was born in uh, Fiji, uh, raised in a, a small town uh, in South Auckland called Mangare Bridge, where uh, our special guest is also from. And um, true story, this to JK, when I was 14, I used to deliver your newspaper and now you're your mom used to tip me every month, you see, and um, I used to put the paper at the doorstep and, um, and not the letterbox, but my, I would have done it for free because I just wanted to get a glimpse um, of, the, <laughs> of you, the, late, the, the next best superstar, the next superstar of All Black Rugby sitting in the kitchen, mate. So I used to go up to interview every morning at six o'clock and put the newspaper down on, on, on the doorstep there for, you, for your folks. Um, I've been a fitness professional for, since 2004. I moved to Melbourne in 2007 uh, with my wife and I. We, um, we opened up a, a boutique studio called Mana Fitness Solutions, where we specialize in athletic development, body transformation, uh, and men's health, obviously working from the, from the inside out. Um, now, our studio is called Mana Fitness. Now, as, as some of you may know, the word Mana is, is, a, is a very powerful word and used amongst the Pacific. Uh, people uh, and it, it has various meanings. It means, um, you know, integrity, honor, respect. Um, the Hawaiians use the word mana to describe the, the power of the ocean uh, and the mountains and the valleys. And um, the uh, Fijians would use it um, to, to describe a chief and the chief um, had mana. And this is a, this is a real great segue into, into our special guests this evening. This, this bloke oozes uh, mana. Uh, and, and has the respect of not just the, uh, the, the sporting world, but also the respect of, of a community that embraces um, and nurtures well-being um, and um, mental wellness. So, um, so JK, welcome. Well, Carl, thank you very much. Katanga te titi, katanga te kaka, katanga hoki a ho te hei mori ora. O tu atua tena koe. Tena koto i otate tena mate. Haere, haere, haere. Kitunga mate, kitunga mate, kitunga ra, kitunga ra. Bula, my friend. Good to see you, my brother. <laughs> Malo, yeah, everyone. Malulele, Nasambula. All, all the races that are out there. It's just fantastic to be here. Love Melbourne. Melbourne's um, a place that I've been to many, many times. I've got some really neat stories from back in the day, but uh, also a lot of, lot of my Italian. Um, yes friends and, and family there, so it's a big Italian town, so tutti di voi che siete la stasera, benvenuto, piacere per me di essere qua. Come stai? Benissimo, grazie, sto benissimo. Bene, grazie. I'm just saying Bene, I'm very well because I was, uh, my, my, my daughter's just made a tiramisu, so tiramisu in, in Italian means pick me up, but it was actually invented in the Italian town that, uh, that uh, we come from, a place called Treviso. All right. But, uh, you know, it's a bit like Pavlova. There's about eight towns in Italy that, that, that claim to them as suicide. So, you know, it's all good. It's all good. Excellent. Um, hey, how, how have you been um, coping, JK, with, with, you know, going back into lockdown? Because obviously New Zealand had 100 days, you know, or, or so COVID-free. Um, and now in Auckland, uh, you're in, in level three. Uh, the rest of the country is, is in level two. How you sort of been coping with it and what's the sort of feel around the grounds? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I didn't cope very well at, at first. Um, I was pissed off, actually. Didn't want to go back in. I was angry. I thought someone was lying. So my first reaction was actually anger. Um, but luckily, because of the journey that I've had with my mental health is I could identify it very quick. Um, and then I made peace with it and just spent a couple of days just looking after myself a little bit more. And, and you know, going through the mental process of it, what happened was in the first lockdown, you know, it's like uh, we're going to war, we're going to war together, we're going, all going to make the sacrifices, lots of adrenaline, you know, and everyone nailed it and we're all really proud. 
of ourselves and, and proud of our countrymen. And I'm sure it was the same in Australia. But the second mm. time, and I think the whole um, stuff that we didn't like about lockdown come flooding back. And, and you know, going from freedom to lockdown was, was difficult. So we've been sort of talking to quite a few people here in New Zealand and, and those emotions have been around, you know, frustration, anger. Um, some people really happy to go back into their, into their bubble because they really enjoyed it. So there's all these different emotions. But what I do is um, I externalise it, so I talk about it. Mm. And once I talk about it, it takes it out of my brain and out on, out on the open and I can start dealing with it. I needed to understand where that emotion was coming from. And right. like I said, I just looked after myself a wee bit more. Yeah, well, we're, um, we're in stage four here in Melbourne. So it's been, it's been a pretty rough ride for us as well, uh, JK, you know, three lockdowns. And, and you're right, you know, it's, it's important that you do, you know, really express yourself and, 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 and own, take the ownership that it is. It is quite a challenging time. Um, we, we've, we've learned a lot, haven't we, over, over the last few months, haven't we, with this COVID? What, yeah, what look, been... And I talk, uh, so I, I talk about making peace with your emotions. Mm. And, um, you know, that sounds a little bit fluffy, but really what it is, is understanding. It's okay to have those emotions. And I think, you know, during my depression, I would always question my emotions, especially when I was a bit sad. I'd go, why are you sad? You shouldn't be sad. You know, I'd be saying all these things to myself. But one of the things, you know, in my mental health journey taught me to, to was to accept, um, to accept my emotions and not bottle them down because I'll come out at the wrong time. So, for example, if I had hung on to that anger, you know, I might have gone out the next day and seen the next door neighbour and he might have pissed me off and I might have yelled at him or something, you know. But, yeah. but if you say I'm angry and, and, and understand why and where it's come from, then you can action it. So I think that's the most important thing. And the learnings um, through that, uh, are good ones to have because, you know, for example, I woke up yesterday and I was just flat. Yeah. You know, I was flat all day. But the, the interesting thing for me is having the tools and techniques. So people, so, you know, when I was incredibly unwell, I was just surviving. And now I'm, I'm thriving, right? Now people say, oh, what's, you know, what's, what's thriving, JK? You always have it. So no, I'm not happy. But what I do have is I have the ability to identify my emotion, make peace with it, and then I've got tools and techniques to make myself the best I can be that day. Right. So, you know, that's what I sort of talk about, you know? Yeah. We'll get, we'll get more into the, into the wellness component um, a little bit down the track, JK. But uh, let's, let's talk a, a little bit about rugby. Now, I know you, you know, you're a humble man. And you, don't wanna, you, you don't like to talk about your accolades. Um, but just for some of the viewers who aren't, aren't aware, you know, 63 tests for the All Blacks, 35 tries. Your World Cup winner in '87, um, multiple games for Auckland, and I used to love watching you play for Auckland. My dad used to take me to Eden Park, and we used to do the the famous Eden Park walk. I'm not too sure if you you know about the Eden Park walk, but we'd sit in the in the East Stand, and then once you scored all your your tries down one end, the whole crowd would get up and walk to the West Stand, and uh, we'll watch you all score your tries down that end. And um, must have been pretty uh, pretty demoralising for the opposition, but you guys, I mean, at that era were invincible. Uh, then, of course, you, you, know, you went on uh, to play for the Warriors and NEC. Now, you, you forgot to add to your, um, your, uh, your resume there, uh, JK, that you were a Gala Shield winner for Marist yep. in 1994. We're, we're on, I'm on that photo. Your name's on that photo with me, but you weren't yep. present for that, um, for that, that photo. Yep. But, uh, I was obviously honoured to have played with you back then. So let's talk about um, sort of prior to the 87 World Cup, when you were sort of young and, and, and you knew you had a little bit of talent, what did you do to, to, to improve that, that talent as a youngster? And, and who or, or, or what inspired you to then say to yourself, okay, well, I'm going to go all the way? Actually, I, I realised I had no talent. <laughs> and that was probably, that was probably uh, the best thing that happened to me. But it was, it was really interesting because once uh, my dad always said to me, if the door opens, go straight through it. Because if you don't, it's going to slam in your face and break your nose. So well, once I knew that I had the opportunity, I tried to work out, um, I always wanted to be the best in the world, right? And so what did I need to do to be the best in the world if I wasn't good enough? And luckily back then, 
You know, we used to get together on a Wednesday afternoon at midday to play test matches. You know, people were bankers. I mean, Joe Stanley, my, my mate, was a, was a concrete truck driver. Lloyd, everyone came from different parts of, of professional working life. Mm -hmm. So I decided very early that what I needed to do was I needed to be fitter than everyone else. I needed to understand diet. I also knew that I was, I was uh, not great in the morning. So I uh, got a trainer in the early years called Peter Young, beautiful man. He died um, a few years ago. You might have remembered him from Marist, Hori. Yeah. Um, and beautiful man died of a brain tumor a few years ago. And he'd come around and get me up and go training. You know, his, his payment was a, was a dozen beer uh, every month. Right. Uh, but what, what I decided to do when I looked around the world was how can I get ahead of everyone else? How can I make a difference? How can I be better than them? And it was through fitness. I mean, my, my poor big mate, Andy Hayden, passed away yeah, uh, God bless him. a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. We went to the funeral and he used to call me um, Lean Dog and I used to call him Big Critter. You know, he was a big critter, but he called me Lean Dog because back in those days, um, they used to have bacon, eggs, steak and eggs, steak, eggs and chips before a game, before a test match, right? Mm. And so I was doing all the studies. So I was the first guy to start eating pasta. And you can imagine, you know, there's a lot of farmers are saying, Jaco, what are you eating that shit for? You know, that's no good for you. And, but that's where Andy Hayden said to me, oh, good work, Lean Dog, you know, Lean yeah, Dog yeah. for a hard road. So really early in the day, I realized I wasn't good enough and had to find something that no one else had. And back then it was... Um, you know, fitness, diet, trying to get ahead of the curve. And speed. You, you had speed and the ability to change direction. I love that story about you going up to One Tree Hill to train um, through, the, through the trees. I went, I went up to One Tree Hill and I, I just kept going up and down the summit. I never went through the trees. Maybe I should have gone through the trees. So, yeah, that story is amazing. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, I, I used to be a butcher with my dad and I'm driving to work one morning and um, I'd say, I said to him, Dad, you know, when I sidestep, after I've made the step, I lose pace. Yes. And dad goes, oh, yeah. And that was it. You know, anyway, <laughs> anyway, he, um, a couple of weeks later, he says to me, oh, you know that problem you got? You're not very good at sidestepping. He said, you know, would you like to learn? I said, yeah, I would like to learn. He said, well, you know, take your boots today. And Wednesday was a big day because it was sausage day, right? So I used to get up six o'clock and make sausages to about 11. So very tiring day. And, um, so in came a guy called Neville Denton, who was very famous in his own right. He was a very great Kiwi back in the day. He lived out right. our way. He was a pig hunter. So anyway, they come in and you know when someone's talking about you, you're there, but it's like you're not. So this is the conversation. I'm standing in the middle and, and, and Neville says to my dad, oh, this is the boy, eh? And dad goes, yeah. And, then, and Neville goes, you're not much good, eh? And dad goes, nah. <laughs> and he says, well... You know, and dad says, oh, I can't step, mate, and keep his pace. And, and Neville goes, oh, well, is he, you know, is he prepared to pay the price? And dad goes, you prepared to pay the price? I says, yeah, I'm prepared to pay the price. So anyway, I go with Neville that yeah. afternoon, right? And the first thing that happened was I go out the back, and he's got his pig dogs in the back of the truck, shouting myself. Like, if you've ever seen a New Zealand pig dog, mate, they're yeah. not the yeah. type to go and put your hand up and say, oh, a nice puppy? Nah. So anyway... I jumped in this car. We went up to, to One Tree Hill. He made me, in Twin Oaks Drive, he made me do about five 400-meter sprints. So I was wow. absolutely touched. And then we went into the, we went into the trees, and, this, and the trees were planted way back when. I mean, the massive trees now. A certain yes. distance apart, even. And then there was a little gap in between this, about, about the fourth row in. Um, and so he said, go, I want you to run through at full pace. Well, I took off, I stepped the first one, and then I, I tried to step the next one, boom, hit the tree. Uh, they can tackle, man, <laughs> the trees can tackle. And I ended up on my ass, yeah. and I could not do it. I could only get through it at about 20%. So he drops me back, and um, once again, him and dad are talking, it's like I don't exist, and, and they've said, yeah, he's not much good, your boy. And I'm, I'm sitting there, bloody hell. And they said, oh, yeah, not much good, but anyway, we'll see what happens. But, so I thought, bugger this, I'll show yeah. them. So I went back every single night until I could run and step the trees. So I don't know if you remember the try I scored against Italy, and I scored yeah. a few for Auckland that year. When, when I was on the field, I'd just run it, and it, I'd be able to change the, 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 the angle of my legs, step when they came into where the tree was, and keep my pace. 
Yes. So, um, so it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It took me, it took me about oh, six or eight weeks to get it down. Um, but anyway, sausage day. So sausage day, you're normally finishing, uh, you know, finishing up the sausages, 11, 30, 12 o'clock. So when I'm just about finished and Neville comes in with a wild pig, right? right. And he drops it down and dad comes in and says, you were prepared to pay the price? This is the price. <laughs> You've got to make this into sausages and ham and all that for, for Neville. And I said, oh, okay. And I started and he said, no, no, not on my time, on right. your time. So you can do it at lunchtime. So every, every three months, Neville would drop in a wild pig and I'd have to butcher it and, and look after it. But it was well worth it, well worth it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, to see that, that try, to me, is probably one of the greatest tries ever scored in, in a World Cup tournament. Um, you know, because normally you'd see a, 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 a try with it running down the sideline, but you had to actually weave in and out of six or six or eight Italians. It was fantastic. Now, um, of course, you were, you play in that era leading up to the to the sort of the nineties, where it was it was pretty pretty hard hardcore in, in the sense that um, you know we, we you had to be tough. You couldn't show emotions, and um, and I, I recall um, coming into the to, to the Marist Club in the, in the early nineties and uh, being coached under. Um, uh, Eric Alassi, of course, uh, the great Eric Colassi, top top man, and you know watching you blokes play, and, and and it was very serious stuff. You know, it was it was full on, um, and there wasn't any room for error. And if you made an error, you'd you'd definitely know about it. But, but to be fair, you know, my first game for um for Maris, we had Terry Wright on the wing, we had Shane Health at fullback, the Brook brothers, um, you know, Bernie, good old Bernie, our mate Bernie, um, and then of course um. You know, if, if, you, if you made a mistake, you, you definitely knew about it. And it was a tough time. How did you sort of manage that, that sort of pressure um, playing at that level um, and, and having to, to be at, at the best, at, at your best? Yeah, you know, I, think, I think the games ended up being, um, I mean, besides some of the mental health issues I went through, which I think is an aside, but, um, you know, I think trainings were so hard and so demanding at the time. So I don't know if you remember the Ponsonby uh, the Ponsonby Maris final in those yes. years, there's like 15 yeah. All Blacks on the field. Yeah. So there's a real uh, demanding culture. So like you said, if you made a mistake, you'd be told about it. You know, you wouldn't get a pat no. on the bum and, you know, it's all good, bro. You wouldn't get that. You'd go, what are you doing? So no. it was a really stressful um, environment to be in. It wasn't personal. It was just setting the standard. So the games became relatively easy because you'd be copying it um, you know, during the week and being forced to be the best that you could be. And by Saturday, you know, people, they certainly wouldn't say, don't worry about it, bro, but they'd just ignore it if you made a mistake because mm -hmm. during the week you'd been sort of, you know, really driven into you that it was about being excellent. We'd, we'd, have, we'd have games or even trainings where we'd say, we don't want to make a mistake. And it was like a competition to yeah. make no mistakes. And I, I think it was... I think it was just that period of time. And also you knew that if you didn't go up to those standards, you probably weren't going to be picked the next week because there's so many good players, you know? Mm. Yeah, but, but you def I definitely had to, um, you almost had to have thick skin, didn't you, playing in that era? Um, oh, totally, yeah. And, and look, I think that, um, you know, the, there are generational things that you need to take into account. And, and that generation was way more aggressive towards each other, but it was no, there was no hard feelings about it. You know, I mm. remember, I remember walking off the, the all black pitch one day and Fitzy turned to me and said, JK, I said, yeah, he said, you trained like shit today. You don't deserve to be out there. Mm. And like my first round was, shut up, you, you know, you, you know, um, but then when I got back to my room and thought about it, he was right. Uh, yeah. You know, and then when I saw him at dinner, you know, we sit together and we have a bit of a laugh. But, you know, he he told me the truth. I didn't like it and I pushed back straight away. But that was the sort of honesty that you got yeah. uh, training all the time. But you but you persisted on. I mean, you even to, to, to dabble in, in the NRO, I mean, that must have been a, um, a, bit, a bit of a, um, a challenge, an even more challenging time. How did you find switching from rugby union and, and going to, to rugby league? Well, I wasn't a very good league player, <laughs> but um, oh, I, I absolutely loved it. So I was brought up in Mangere, as you know, up the road from you. Um, you know, my father was a leaguey, so we would oh. go every Sunday to Carlo Park, you know, and I'd watch the, you know, I'd watch my, my cousin was Mark Graham. So who was my hero when I was growing up? 
you know, I'd watch Os Olsen Filipina, the Foo oh, Brothers, yeah. Northcote, uh, you know, all these amazing, Gary Prime, all these amazing league players on a Sunday with my dad. So I loved rugby league. I was brought up with rugby league. My auntie Morvan was my coach. Um, you know, I played photo who rugby league through till I was about 14. Because back in those days, you played all sports. I played, you know, league in the morning, rugby in the afternoon, yeah. soccer on a Sunday. And so I always loved my rugby league. And I, I, it was really interesting because I got offered a lot of money to do it, right? And the first time I turned it down, um, you know, I, I turned it down because I thought, oh, you know, what am I doing? I won't be able to make it. And you know what happened? I'd say every night I'd say, what if? What mm. if? What if? And around about that time, I, I, I read a Michael Jordan book about when he went from basketball to, um, baseball. to baseball. Yeah, and he said that one of his main uh, motivations was he didn't want to have what if in his life. And that really struck a chord with me. And I thought, it doesn't matter if I'm not any good at it because I don't want to live with what if. And I went, I had a great time, made some great mates. Um, it was different training, shit, it was hard. Like I, I couldn't walk for like three weeks because we'd come from, you know, rugby was transitioning, it was still amateur. So, you know, although I'd go to the gym, I'd sort of make my own weights up and do a little bit of this. We had a guy called Jim Blair, who was a great, yeah. he passed away last week as well, sort of a leader oh, wow. in fitness, but it was, wasn't weights oriented. I go to the Warriors, man, and they just, like I went from 95 kilo on the bench to 165 kilos in six months. You know, we do this Bulgarian wave where you do like 25 sets of, of, uh, yes. of weights, but I loved it. And I loved, I loved that I've done it. And, you know, I'm a passionate Warriors fan. It's, it's hard to be sometimes, but, um, you know, I love the Warriors and, and it was a great couple of years. Absolutely. Yeah. Good old Warriors. I just want to um, quickly touch on your, your coaching career. Um, you, you coached the Italian rugby national team. Um, and then, of course, you went on to, to Japan. The, first of all, why did you choose it, Italy? Uh, well, I first went to Italy when I was, um, I first went to Italy when I was 20. Mm. So I actually had my 21st over there. And um, there's a funny story because I'm, I'm at training and we're on Eden Park number two. And uh, what was happening was I was you know, training, running around, to, you know, this and that. I'm working for my dad at the time. I'm earning sort of 75 bucks a week. And uh, at the end of training, there's these two um, pretty flash looking guys, you know, like uh, dressed pretty cool, you know, and we're, we've sort of come from the butcher shop and builders and all that sort of stuff. So you know, they stood out a wee bit. You know, at the end of training, they said to me, oh, JK, so this is 1985, right? So they said, JK, you know, we'd love you to come and play in Italy. I said, oh, that sounds really interesting. They said, and we'll give you $3,000, right? Wow. And I'm going, three grand. You know, I'm earning, I'm earning like 300 bucks a month with my dad. So I get home and I'm really excited. And I say to dad, I said, dad, you know, there's these guys at training tonight. And, um, you know, they've offered me three, three grand to go and play in Italy. And he said to me, what'd they look like? And I said, well, one had a suit jacket on and he had his long hair and his hair in a ponytail and the other one had jeans and a suit top on. And he said, don't bloody trust them, boy. <laughs> so totally stereotyped them. So he yeah. said, you're not going. So I'm going, oh, come on, Dad. So he said, you find out more about them. So I went, did a bit more research and they were actually down there for the Benetton family. Um, yeah. So what happened was, you know, I did some research and they were legitimate. So I went back to my dad and I said, Dad, look, they're legit. And they're going to pay me that money. And he said, oh, that's good. I'm pleased they're legit, but it's too much for you. So you can give half to your brother-in-law and your sister and you can take them. So I did that. So my brother-in-law, John Arkoy, um, came over with me with my sister Sue. They were married at the time. He played for Villalba. I gave him half the money and, um, and uh, I played for Benetton. So that's how it all started. And I fell in love with the place. Um, you got to remember, grew up in Mangere, um, meat and three veggies. We, so I'm from a butcher's household. We had meat and three veggies, but mum and dad didn't like pork or chicken. So there you go. So you imagine what our meals were every night. And, and you know, dad would have a lion red or a whiskey and mum would have a cooked chasseur out of the, out of the cask, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I fly to Italy and, man, there's this, this whole new culture, this whole new world. I mean, yeah. you know, I flew into Venice. Treviso is a medieval town um, just, out, out of, just out of Venice. And I just... I just couldn't believe it. You know, the first night, like there was 
about eight courses with different wines. And I thought, oh, shit, that's nice of them to put on a feed like that for me, you know? If it wasn't for me, they do that every night, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the coaching, did you enjoy the coaching over there? Um, yeah, well, the playing, was, the playing was amazing. And then at the end of my career in Japan, I spent a year coaching. And then I came back and I managed the Blues in 2000. Okay. Um, and then I got the opportunity to go over to Italy as an assistant. Mm -hmm. And um, I, just re I, I just felt that, you know, here I am, a butcher from Mangere, who's seen the world. I've lived in Italy. I've been all around the world. I've lived in Japan. And, you know, I just felt that if I could, I wanted to coach because I felt if I could create that environment for other people to, to, to thrive and, mm -hmm. and see the world and, and, and use what abilities they've had or what God's given them or Allah or whoever's given them, mum and dad or whatever, you know, to really use their strengths to, to use a sport to see the world. So that was my motivation and it really captivated me. It was always challenging. I don't think I was a, um, a fantastic coach. So it was always a challenge for me, you know, some of the, some of the things, keeping up with stuff, trying to change things. The Italian experience was fantastic. It was really neat. And then, um, you know, obviously after that, I went to Japan and yeah. I'd finished my career in Japan and I love the Japanese people and love their culture. So that was a fantastic ride as well. And came back to the blues and, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, didn't work out as planned, but yeah. um, certainly had a great time. Absolutely. I mean, you, 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 you've done so much and, um, you know, in your early years, you, you, you obviously you were, you, you were struggling and um, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. And, that 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 moment where you <clears throat> where you hit a wall, J.K. and and um, the the sort of moments leading up to it, if you don't mind sharing it, and then of course that the particular moment that we that that really sort of said to, you had that light bulb that that's this is it, you know, it's time to um, to do something about it. Yeah, yeah. so um, I was a I was an anxiety um, based depressant. I didn't know that at the time, so I was having anxiety attacks and just hiding them. So. Um, if you have an anxiety attack, you can have an anxiety attack and then it'll leave you um, and you go back to relatively normal. But what it does is it leaves a little scar and I call that scar fear. Um, so what had happened is I'd have an anxiety attack and I'd put it in the cupboard and ignore it because I didn't know what it was. And um, then I kept ignoring it, kept ignoring it. I probably had my first anxiety attack at probably 13 or 14, something like oh, that. Wow. I think they called it homesickness back then. But it wasn't affecting my life. And, you know, I carried on and had these moments and didn't really take too much notice of them. And then as I started to get more successful with rugby, they started to come a whole lot more. And I just kept ignoring them. I remember one morning I got up and I went to Radio Hauraki with Kevin Black, um, who's a famous DJ yeah, over yeah. here in New Zealand. You, you remember him? Cool. Um, and I get there at seven o'clock in the morning and he cracked a bottle of champagne. I mean, he was bouncing off the walls. I don't know what he was on, man, but he was having a good time. And I had a glass of champagne. I went downstairs and hopped in my car and it was like being in a sardine can. It was like my whole, the whole car closed in on me. My heart started beating. I started sweating and it was an anxiety attack. And back then, the fear that I had in the car at that moment was that if I drive, I'm going to drive off the Harbour Bridge or I'm going to drive into someone or something's going to happen. So I sat frozen there for about an hour. Then I went home, went to sleep, um, got up and thought, shit, I'm never going to drink champagne ever again in the morning. That's not good for you. Um, so then I, I ignored it and ignored it. And then my anxiety fell into a depression, which can happen. So anxiety and depression, two different illnesses, but they can fall in to depression. I just woke up one day and those anxiety attacks didn't go. I spoke to no one, told no one, hit it. Until one night I was in a hotel room in Buenos Aires and I was, I was sick of fighting this in my head. So, you know, a minute... Um, felt like an hour, an hour felt like a day, and a day felt like a week. So I was incredibly tiring. I was hiding it, which was, you know, doubling the pressure. I just finished an anxiety attack, and and um, I just said, oh, I'm going to run and jump out the window. I said to myself, the window was open on the 10th floor. And Michael Jones, so Michael Jones was lying next to me at the time, and he said, uh, you know, JK, you've got a good heart. Mm. And I don't know why he said it. I mean, Michael's very religious, and, and so he believes that God told him to... To tell me so I'm really happy about that mm. um, you know and those words saved my life and the next day I scored twice for the All Blacks it was like it was like I was running on the field but the real me was up in the stand watching it was like a dream but I finally got home and reached out and got help and the interesting thing is I went to my doctor 
And you know who my doctor was? My doctor was the All Black doctor, Dr. John right. Mayhew, who was on tour with me for four weeks, but I wouldn't talk to him. But then once I reached out, um, he first sent me to um, a guy who wanted me to be a volcano. You know, so I reach out, big moment for me, go and see someone. This guy wants me to be a volcano. Got okay. all this power. I, mean, I don't want to be a volcano, you dick. I just want to get well, you know. So he wasn't the right guy for me. And I'm sure the volcano guys helped a lot of people, but it wasn't for me. But actually, yeah. at the time, that set me back because you got to realize that my reference to mental health back then was one flow of the cuckoo's nest, right? And this is serious because I had no reference to mental health. Never spoken about it, didn't know what it was. But I thought if I speak to someone about this, they're going to lock me up in, in a straitjacket, put me in the, in, the, in, the, in the loony bin with bloody Jack Nicholson and Chief, you know, the big American Indian yeah, guy. Yeah. But that was a real fear, you know. Mm. So anyway, the first guy, and I can laugh about the volcano guy now, but after reaching out, that set me back a couple of steps because I said to Doc, well, it didn't work, you know. Um, but anyway, he convinced me. And then I, the second person I went to was a, was a woman called Dr. Louisa Armstrong. She was fantastic. So I remember um, sitting down in her office and she said to me, JK, what would you do if you had a tight hamstring? And I said, well, I'd stop and stretch it. She said, okay, stop and stretch it. Then you get up and you keep running and it gets really tight. What would you do? And I said, well, I'd um, stop, put ice on it and go to the physio. She said, well, your brain's no different right? And I thought, shut up. You know, I've got a hamstring in the head. What's the ice? And who's the physio? And once I accepted my illness, because it is an illness, right? It's not a weakness. I thought for five or six years that it was a weakness. I wasn't good enough. Because what anxiety and depression does, it does three things. It takes away your self-esteem, takes away your self-confidence, and takes away your enjoyment in life. They're three pretty, pretty big things, right? Very big, yeah. So I thought it was me. I thought I was weak, wasn't good enough, wasn't handling the pressure, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. But once I realized that it was an illness, then I had something to work on. And once I accepted it, so this is another important point. Always accept it, but never give up. Mm. So I was scared that if I accepted it, I'd give up and I might do something. So right. once I accepted it as an illness, I said to her, right, I want to be great at this. I want to be great at this. And so that sort of, you know, when I talk about, and I was just surviving then. So I learned all these tools and techniques that keep me well on a daily basis, keep me thriving on a daily basis. But there, that, um, there was a, obviously a process you, you had to go through, right? So, you know, that moment you had in Buenos Aires, you know, you had a mate there with you, didn't you? And then of course you, you opened up to, to a doctor and it, it was Dr. May who, now, you know, it, it could have been another doctor, but you still, you did those steps, those very important steps. Um, you took hold of it. You took responsibility. Um, and then, of course, you know, maybe the volcano man didn't help, but the next doctor did. And it, it is about finding that right process for you, uh, never giving up, like you said, um, and, then, and then sort of just harnessing that and, and thriving um, rather than surviving. I, I love that thriving and surviving. Is that, is that yours? Did you, did you come up with that? Probably not. <laughs> Yeah, no, nah, probably not. <laughs> but, oh, it, but, that's, but that's how I feel. But the most, the most important thing about that, and, and look, the, the, the interesting thing about, about me was, I'll, I'll tell you we story. We play touch, right? And we're shit. We used to be really good, but now we're shit, right? But we play and we have a good time. And a mate of mine came around the other day and said to me, you know, Jack, I did my bloody knee at touch. I said, oh, shit, what happened? He said, oh, you know, I bloody twisted it. You know, I said, I've been to the doctor. I said, oh, what did the doctor say? The doctor said, take some anti-inflammatories, but I think you need to go and see a specialist. Right? Okay. So I went and saw the specialist, and the specialist said, I think you've done your ACL, boy, and we're going to operate on you in three weeks' time. And the, and the guy was telling me this. He's saying, guess what? You know, that was it's Sonny Bill Williams's bloody uh, doctor, surgeon. I said, well, I hope, hope he gives you his abs and a bit of his pace, mate, because we need it, you know what I mean? But anyway... So he knew he was going to have the operation three months and get back to touch. But he said to me, JK, that's not why I'm here. I'm not, not here to talk to you about that. I said, oh, what's, what's up, bro? He said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really unwell mentally. I think I've got depression. And, and I said, well, what are you doing about it? And he said, well, I'm talking to you. <laughs> and I said, I'm a butcher. <laughs> you know? um, now, I can help you because I've got life experience. But look what he did with the physical side of his body. Went to the doctor, took anti-inflammatories went to the specialist, knew he had to have an operation, knew there was three months recovery, right? 
And I think sometimes we think this is separate from the rest of our body. So if you just take it and say, look, I, if I'm struggling, look, if one of the first guys I reached out to told me to harden up, right? And that was yeah. really hard at the time. And he's a good mate of mine. And I've spoken to him since. And he said, well, I didn't know what to bloody say, JK. So I just said what I thought I could say. And this is really important if someone reaches out to you. We don't have to be the specialists. We don't have to try and have the answers. No. All we have to do is listen and walk with them, you know. Just going, just going with me, just going with me to the doctors or to the psychiatrist the first time was great help for me because I didn't feel alone, you know. I had, mm. had, to, had to try and get through that stuff by myself, but I had someone to come with me. So I think, you know, often we worry about when people present that, you know, we're either going to say the wrong thing or we try and say something. Instead, we just say, look, it must be really hard. I'm here for you. How can I help you? Should we go to the doctor together? Things like that. Mm. Now, the, um, the, the stats are high here in Australia too. You know, um, one in four live in, with mental illness. Um, and, you know, I could rattle them on, but the biggest surprise stat for me is three out of five don't ask for help here, here in Australia, which is, um, you know, which is, which is kind of daunting because it, it is, it's not difficult, is it? Um, and you've just obviously went over the process of how you did it with your friends and vice versa. But, um, you know, you, you uh, obviously made a decision uh, that the stats were uh, too high in New Zealand and, and you were going to take the next step. So what did, what did you do, JK, to, 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 when, when you woke up that day and you said, right, things have to change? Firstly, it was the hardest thing I ever did ask for help, right? So, so the most important thing for anyone out there who's struggling is I know how hard it is. Because, like I said before, people think it's a weakness, right? Mm. They don't think it's an illness. They think it's a weakness. And the mind, and the mind takes, it, it takes some, it does some strange things sometimes. So, mm. you know, I thought I was going to lose everything. But what happened with me was after I came back and, um, and sort of met this woman, Louise, and then she started teaching me different, different things that I could do to keep myself well. I thought getting well was going to be really complicated, but it was actually a whole lot of simple things done on a regular basis. And for yes. me, learning those tools and techniques was, was incredibly helpful. So I would go and do stuff and feel better. And so I'd start putting those things in my day. You know, and the other thing that's really important is understanding your own mind as well. I can tell you a couple of stories about that. So, so what happened was I became the face of this in New Zealand um, and came out and did an anti-stigma campaign. And then I was about to walk into the Lions series in 2005 and, um, and um, a young guy came up to me wearing a shirt and tie and he knocked and tapped me on the shoulder and said, JK, I'm a young lawyer here in Wellington. If it wasn't for you, I'd be dead and walked away. And that had a, a really profound effect on me. So I rang the Minister of Health the next day. I said, I want to do some hope ads. And then a few years later, we created a thing called depression.org.nz in a journal, which was the first ever online tool. Mm -hmm. And so there was all this stuff going on. But about four years ago, um, I kept getting the stats, right? So I, I'd been the face of it. And I felt as if I'd failed because, you know, in New Zealand, um, a male a day commits suicide. A, a New Zealander and a half, um, you know, commit suicide a day. So mm. I was seeing 603, 69, 620, 635, 668 last year. And I'm going, you know, this is, this shouldn't be happening in Australia, eight attempts and eight suicides a day. So it's a pandemic, you know, we're living in a pandemic it's called COVID, but 800,000 people committed suicide last year, right? So that's a pandemic as well. But I think we can fix this pandemic. So um, about four years ago, I felt that I needed to change a couple of things. So what I've done is um, I've created a JK Foundation and we've raised some money to create a curriculum in the schools to teach kids about mental health, the IQ of it and the EQ of it. And then um, I created a, a company with a, my, my business partner, Adam Clark, um, called Mentimia, where we want to deliver... Um, everyday mental health tools and techniques in an engaging way so yes. you can create habitual change um, and we knew what was coming with COVID so we gave it away in New Zealand and we also gave it away to our Australian uh, brothers and sisters so you can download that and what that is is really the tools and techniques that I learned uh, when I was just surviving 
to thriving today. And um, and Give so you can... Give us a couple of those techniques. Give us a couple of those. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a couple. Um, so uh, I went and saw my mum. I was really unwell. I said, mum, I'm dead. And she said, well, the good thing about you being dead, boy, is you're still here. So uh, you should start again. And that was quite liberating because I didn't think you could start again, but you can. Um, so I got up the next day and she said, you need to smell the roses, right? So my smelling of the roses was actually um, just having a shower. Now, yeah. what normally happens in the shower is you're either thinking about the future or thinking about the past or, right? Whereas I just felt the shower. And for the first couple of weeks of me coming out of my depression, that's what I looked forward to. And I still love a shower today. You know, for me, it just the water washes over me, washes away the stress and anxiety. And I just absolutely love it. Another, another one you might like um, is I walk like a Fijian. <laughs> and I know you're Fijian. Uh, uh, Fiji me again, please. Yeah. So, uh, and you'll love the story. So I'm flying to Fiji, and I love the Pacific Islands. My my brother-in-law's um, Samoan, and I think my mate Steve Howell here. He's on online. He's Samoan too. So I love the island culture, love the island people. Um, but I'm flying to Fiji, and I get on the plane, and there's a whole lot of um, you know Palangis and Pakias like me. And um, we get to Fiji, and I'm down the back behind these two young Fijian boys, and the the thing goes on the thing and all the, all the Balangis are up and they've got their trolleys and they're off, you know, and they're out the door, and, you know, yeah, through yeah, customs yeah. and, you know, bottle of gin at the bloody duty free and they're standing by the conveyor belt. But I was trapped behind these two uh, young Fijian boys and they walked slowly out of the aircraft and went, Bula, man, Bula. I don't know if they knew the guy outside the door, but they said hello to him. They got the customs, Bula, brother, Bula, you know, and they're saying hello and they're talking and walking really slowly and I'm behind them thinking, how good is this? Yeah. And then, you know, they, they get through customs. By the time they got to the conveyor belt, you know what was happening? What was that? Everyone else's bags were coming out. <laughs> so, so what that taught me was, if you walk slowly, it's done two things in my life. If you walk slowly, you see trees around you, people look at you, you smile and say hello to people and you get there about 45 seconds later, mm. right? Not, you don't miss anything. So I, but, but, but it's also interesting, you've got to train yourself to do it. You know, mm. a lot of people are getting injured walking with their phones. You know, our brains, I interviewed 3,500 people from Intermere, right? And we interviewed all these people, myself and Dr. Fiona Crichton, and, and people were saying to me, JK, my mind's on a treadmill. It's just going so fast. And you know why? We get more inputs in a day than our grandparents had in a lifetime. Mm. You know, you think about you think about walking slow. You don't do it anymore because your mind's racing. You think about sitting down and having a cup of coffee. You know, you're looking at your phone. There's all these things that are into our mind all the time. Yeah, and so I, you've I, got to learn. So when when your computer craps out, what do you do? I you know, turn it off and on the wall. Turn, turn it off and on exactly. And, and 98 percent of the time it works. We've got to do that with our brains, right? Yeah. So I have a shower. I walk really slowly. I sit and drink a cup of coffee without the phone. And I really enjoy that moment, right? Yeah. I breathe. So another thing that happened was um, I was really, really unwell. I had to go on antidepressants. And I went to Dr. Louise Armstrong and she said to me, you know, JK, the, the uh, antidepressants are going to give you some balance, but you need to start working on your illness. And I said, oh, okay. You know, what do you want me to do? And she said, well, you need to breathe. I said, what do you mean? I'm standing in front of you. I'm breathing. She says, no, you need to breathe properly. Yes. And breathing changed my life, right? So breathing was how I started to attack my anxiety because I was having anxiety attacks while I was flying. And I loved flying. I used to, pre, pre my depression, loved flying. During it, hated it because I was having anxiety attacks. And now I'm back to loving it because I started to attack my, my, um, my anxiety through breathing. So she taught me how to breathe very deeply into my stomach. And what happens when I'm feeling stressed, my, my shoulders go up. Mm. So whenever I hop in the car, I always drop, breathe heavily, drop my shoulders and breathe. And I'll, and I'll breathe five or six times a day at least. Mm. And when I can feel myself a bit tense, I'll stop and breathe. Or if I'm going into a meeting that might be a bit stressful, I'll stop and breathe. Another thing that um, another thing that I do, I've got a monkey brain. As I say, a monkey brain, um, I call my monkey Bob. So Bob the monkey. So for example, if you can meditate, fantastic, you should do it. If you can do yoga, you should do it. But I can't because Bob is just off. He's gone, mate. Bob's yeah. doing his own shit. So um, 
I'm an active relaxer. So for me, I either cook, I read. Yes, um, during, COVID, during COVID, I've taken up the guitar, but it sounds mm -hmm. like I'm strangling a cat in the lounge. But it's not actually about how good I am at playing the guitar. It engages Bob. For me, that's like I'm plugging the computer. Yes. Um, so I do those things every day. I mean, I love surfing. This is another. This is another interesting. Another mate of mine came around the other day. He's feeling a bit stressed and pressure. I said, "What do you do for your? What do you do for your mental health?" He said, oh, "I play golf." I said, "When was the last time you played golf?" He said, four weeks ago." Said, well, that's not too good. You know, <laughs> I surf, but I can't surf all the time. I love doing it, but the most important thing is to have these daily little daily things that you do to keep yourself incredibly well. And I have a few others as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the um, the the app that you that you have the, the worry map you know, up, you know that's brilliant you know how you also put in anything that's concerning you and then you go through the process of elimination and and find out what you can control what you can't control um you know that the, the the other tips that you that you have it's it's great i mean i, I use it at jk it's, it's a wonderful tool and you know all, all that you can you can almost feel all, the, all that sort of sense of, of stories that you have when you're using it and it's very it's very user friendly um but um Look, it's 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 great how you, you these analogies uh, that you that you're using um, are, are very understandable and and you know, very appreciative too, because there's there's obviously a few younger viewers on on this um, this call too. But um, I guess um, there's there's probably a few questions that uh, need to be that uh, people have been asking that, sure. that we'll go through. Yeah, love to. Um, I'll start with um, one here, which is... Um, someone, I saw someone say about the, the game against uh, the Mighty Moolers when we lost the Shield. It was the worst game I ever played in Auckland jersey, so I remember it really well. The, what year was Waikato, that? the Waikato team deserved to take the Shield off us in 1990, I think it was, but it was the worst game of rugby I've ever played. So I remember it like yesterday. I think Warren Gatlin and... and but you uh, were playing, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, there's a few, there's a few out there. Ian Foster right. might have been out there as well. I've got a, a question here that I got earlier on from one of the young um, under 14 players at Harlequins Rugby, Louis Tracy. He's, he's asking, you know, it's hard for a young, young man to talk to friends about how they're feeling. You know, how do we best help these, your mates that are struggling at such a young age? What, what would be the best way to do this? Yeah, look, I think um, we shouldn't underestimate the pressure that our youngsters are under. Um, you know, I think there's, I think I was a generation behind my dad. So, you know, I was going to smoke behind the shed, steal a bottle of lime red, drive his car when I shouldn't, all that sort of stuff. Because, it, But he'd already done it, mm. right? So we were a generation apart. But I think our youngsters, we don't know the world that they live in with modern technology. And I think the pressure on them is way higher than it was on us. So, you know, have you ever seen an ugly photo on Facebook? <laughs> you know, everyone's, everyone's beautiful. Success, you know, success is about having private jets and gold and beautiful and all that sort of stuff. So a lot of pressure on people. Plus, we keep telling them that, uh, you know, no you studying because your jobs are not going to be there in 10 years. So there's a lot of fear out there for these young people. So I think first thing we need to do is not pretend that we know how they live, but... The most important thing that I got taught, if you want to deal with mental health, is show some vulnerability yourself. So I wrote a book called Stand By Me, where they they said to me, um, you know, uh, the best thing you can do is sit down and have dinner every night. And I, we do that. We're an Italian household. And the second thing is to show some vulnerability. And I went, whoa. And they said, well, you don't have to cry the first night, you know. Yeah. But you can say, I'm a little bit anxious about this. So I think for those young fellas... Um, you know, if you can talk to your parents about it, you should. I think that's really important. You've got counsellors at school. But when you're talking about your mates, yeah, mate. just, start with, just, just start with some little, um, you know, some little discussions around mental health. Oh, man, I'm feeling really anxious. And, you know, just start the conversation so at least it's not, uh, you know, slamming in your face. And I, think, and I think if you can just start talking about mental health, bring up the conversation in a non-offensive way, you know, Say to your rugby coach, I want to talk about mental health. You know, how's everyone's mental health? How are we doing, brothers? You know, talk to the coaches about making it part of the agenda. And this is one of the things that we're trying to do with Mentor Mayor as well. Put it on the agenda at work. So mm -hmm. when you're a young fella, if you're worried about someone, just step in and just show a little bit of vulnerability. Say, oh, you know, 
spoke to JK the other night. We were talking about mental health. Everything all right, bro? You know, it's okay to feel down. Um, and then if they do reach out to you, don't try and have the answers. Try and walk with them, you know. Try and walk with them to get some help. Oh, we'll go and see, you know, the counsellor at school or we'll go and see, you know, Jose at the rugby club. That's what you're for. You're in charge of well-being. And just reach out to those people, um, you know, that you know are safe and will help you. Excellent. Excellent answer, JK. So now the another question here is probably the other end of the scale, uh, working in the corporate um, sector, you know, showing vulnerability again, you know, that fear of potentially losing your position. Um, if you're showing any sign of vulnerability, I mean, you can always translate that to the, to the field. You know, if you, if you get injured, you don't want to leave the field because you don't want someone to take your position. You know, how, how do you, how, how would you manage that in, in the corporate scene? Um, not, you, you, yes, show vulnerability, but at the same time, you don't want to be, you don't lose your job, basically. Yeah, no, exactly. And this is one of the things that meant to me is trying to change, right? What we're trying to change is the stigma and the fear around talking about our mental health. And we firmly believe that it's the future. You know, great, great um, people want to belong to great companies. And everyone says to me, oh, you know, millenniums, they, you know, they don't want to stay. They ask me all these questions. But what they do is they drive a different culture. So my suggestion is you've just got to try and get it on the agenda at work. You know, what is this company doing for our um, health mm. and well-being and our mental health? And I think they're important conversations to have because it, it's really noisy out there at the moment. And COVID has taught us one thing, to be open and honest about our mental health. You know, we can say it's an anxious time, you know. And I think, I also think that the businesses that adopt those things will actually be the, the businesses that survive in the future because, you know, it's about people. It's about looking after your mental health, your people. So my, my advice is to ask the company, what are you doing about our mental well-being and our mental health? What's available? And um, how can I, you know, reach out and talk about it? And then when I go in and talk to companies, there's always people that want to be champions. And if you've got some lived, lived experience, you should go and talk to HR and, and say, look, I want, to be, I want to be part of this journey. I want to help. I want to make sure that this is a really neat place to, to be. Because I don't believe, I think in our parents' time, they had uh, work-life balance. Um, they had work and life. We don't have that anymore. We've got life, right? And it's just one continuum. You know, when you think about our parents, when they went home, um, you know, they went home at five o'clock at night, nothing followed them. I mean, dad used to listen to 1ZB. By the time he got home, he was pretty chilled out of whiskey and it was all good, you know. Um, he went home on the weekend, Friday night. I mean, Saturday trading came in. He said, you're bloody working. I'm not working on a Saturday. You know, and he'd go back to work on a Monday and there was, um, you know, there was no, no nothing followed him. We, we are doing emails at 11 o'clock at night. You know, we're yeah. doing emails on Sunday. We're doing, so we don't stop anymore. So there's no work-life balance. And I think with COVID, with us in lockdown, we've also learned that, shit, you can be on these things all day and you've got to look after your mental health. So my, my advice is you have every right to push for great mental health in the workplace, and you should. Um, and if you see someone who might not be, getting along too well, ask HR what's available for us, what can we do, and how can we make this a great mental health place to work? Mm. Excellent. So a rugby question here. Um, right. Best coach ever had and, and why? Um, I, had a, I had some great coaches. Um, John Hart obviously is very special to me because he picked me as an 18 year old out of the third grade with Eric Gorlassi. Um and my world and my life changed. So he was absolutely amazing. I had a, had a Italian coach, Andre Buonomo, who really um, changed my philosophy. He, as the French and Italians do, it's not a sport, it's an art form. And yeah. so he would, um, you know, he was a philosopher of rugby. And that, that was really nice because I had the contrast from New Zealand. So he, you know, he, he was really amazing. So those two were probably, um, you know, the biggest influences that I had. That's awesome. So you picked out a third grade, did you say? Yeah, I'd never played senior rugby before I played for Auckland. So I was playing third grade under, under Eric. And um, I was playing out at Mount Ross School. Uh, and uh, John Graham, who was then headmaster of Auckland Grammar, came to watch me play. And then the following week, John Hart asked me uh, if I'd play for Auckland. So I did. Brilliant. Yeah. 
you said Roscoe as in Roscoe Grammar? Uh, no, Mount Roscoe as in Mount Roscoe Rugby, yeah. Yeah, actually, I played a season yeah. for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah down, down, down the hill down, there, isn't it? Fairham Park down the hill, is it Fairham Park? Park? That's it, yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's still there, actually. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Um, not that I was, I was, I was following your, your footsteps, JK, but uh, I got close, didn't I? Um, <laughs> what, um, what stops people from reaching out for help? Fear. So, like, I thought I, I, thought I was going nuts. I thought I was weak. I thought it was a weakness. Um, and the, one of the other reasons that Mentimia is trying to change the dialogue is, you know, a lot of mental health dialogue is steeped in failure. And we have a perception that mental health is the extreme of mental health. Whereas, um, so our knowledge of it isn't great. So we think that it's this really um, bad thing and it's got a whole lot of ramifications. So, so to reach out, people are, are, are going back into their memory bank and thinking, oh, you know, shit, I might be stigmatized. I might be, you know, I might lose my job. I might not get that. Um, you know, that promotion. And, and I think in the past, those things might have happened, but I think we are coming into the new age very, very quickly. But really, I think the, I think the biggest thing for me about not reaching out was, uh, you know, I'd lost my self-confidence. I'd lost mm -hmm. my self-esteem. I thought I was useless. I thought I wasn't good enough. I thought it was me. So they are really hard things to talk about. And also, one of the things that happened with me, one of my anxieties was I'd have these really bad thoughts, like, you know, I'm going to pick up a knife and stab myself or stab someone else. I'm going to drive my car off the harbour bridge. And, you know, I can talk to you about them now, but at the time, they are really scary things to tell someone because you think, shit, how are they going to react, you know? And once you find out that, you know, that it's quite normal, then... Um, you know, I think you you have more confidence around, oh, okay, it's normal, I can work on this, you know, it's just mm. dumb thought, we all have dumb thoughts and you learn to let them go. So a lot of the stigma involved in mental health in the past is what stops people. That's why by showing vulnerability yourself, um, it, it makes people a little bit more comfortable to, to sort of reach out. Absolutely, 100%. Okay, one more rugby question here. Toughest uh, opponent? Toughest, toughest opponent um, was a guy called Matt Burke. He actually um, smashed my shoulder up in, in, uh, in 1984 in Australia. I got operated on, actually in Adelaide. Um, they don't operate on it anymore. So he, he, was, pretty, he was pretty tough. But I so, think David, yeah. David Campisi was probably, um, you know, one of the guys who I used to love to mark because he was so much better than me, faster, better, better step. Um, so it was always a big challenge for me to mark Campo and, We've got a really nice friendship as well, um, you know, post the game and that sort of stuff. I, you know, saw him quite a bit in Italy, played up the road in Padova. So, yeah. You guys still keep in touch? Yeah, I still see him quite a bit. Yeah, I see him around the traps when, when uh, Australia play New Zealand and during World Cups we catch up. So, I've, I see him quite a bit. So, you've got over 80,000 users uh, with, with the app, which is brilliant, including myself. Um, it's free till till the end of uh, November, is that right? For Australians and the New Zealanders alike? Yeah. Um, like it's, it's, it's a, like I said, I've been using it. It's a wonderful tool. I've got Ian texting me at the same time. Um, yeah, so this is, there, there's so much more questions. Unfortunately, we can't answer everyone's, um, JK, but I really do appreciate you taking out the time um, to answer some of those questions, um, but more importantly, just sharing your, your journey, mate. It's been very in inspiring, to say the least. Um, and I know all our viewers that um, have jumped on um, will we'll take a lot out of this, if not a little, um, and they'll go apply these these um, these these little initiatives that you that you you discussed earlier. Like what what I've been doing myself personally is our, our sort of daily checklist, a daily wellness plan. So really appreciate your time here, J.K. Oh, you're welcome. It's lovely to catch up again, boys from Mangere. But yeah, look, um, my advice is, is download Mentimia, get your families to download it. You know, it's, it's about just in, engaging. It's about small habitual change. It should be fun. It's about understanding yourself, which took me way too long. Um, you know, what we want to be able to do is just have a really simple daily mental health plan that takes you from surviving to thriving, especially now, people. 
I mean, we are living, you know, Fitz, Sean Fitzpatrick, my old mate and captain, worst roommate, because they're worst roommate you ever want to have. I was so pleased when they made him captain because captains get their own room, so I don't have to room with them anymore. You know, smelly forwards. But, but anyway, I rang him the other day, we're great mates, and he said to me, you know, JK, there's no blueprint for the shit that's happening. You know, the, when we grew up, our parents would talk about the depression or the great wars or, you know, and so there's no blueprint for this. You know, we don't know um, what the future looks like at the moment. That's stressful and that, you know, that, that, that's hard to live with. So the thing that meant to me, will teach you, teach you a few tools, just live for today, you know, mm. do the worry mat because otherwise it can feel a bit overwhelming. So you know, just download it, get your mates to download it, tell your work to download it, tell your work to go and do it, and just enjoy it and just find yourself a, a daily mental health plan. Walk like a Fijian, have a Walk shower, like learn how to meditate, you know, learn learn a worry map, which saved my life. So, yeah, it's been a pleasure, mate. Been a pleasure. Yeah, mate. It'd be great to catch up with you someday again for, for a coffee. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. I love Melbourne. Like I said to you before, back in the day, um, a friend of mine, this is... 35 years ago, he said, JK, I was going to Melbourne by myself. He said, JK, if you hop into a cab, the cab driver will be um, either Italian or Greek, and you ask him to take him to your, his mother's rest. And I said, are oh, you talking shit, mate? He said, no. And I jumped in this cab, and I said to this guy, mate, I don't want to be rude, but my mate said that um, if you were either Greek or Italian, could you take me to your favorite restaurant? He said, I'm Greek. I'll take you to my mum's restaurant, but it's 40 minutes. So I said, oh, that's a good way. So we went. He ended up sitting with me. We had this great meal. It was just the greatest night I ever had. And I'll never forget that. Brilliant. Awesome. I could, I could listen to more stories, uh, JK, but um, Ian's texting me here saying, uh, okay, wrap it up. But um, love yeah. your work. Love it. Great to, great to t- finally chat to you. And um, go the Ameris boys. Yeah, go the Ameris boys. <laughs> and maybe yeah. we can do this ag- again sometime, man. Absolutely. We'll do a follow-up for sure. Thank you so much. All right. Stay well, my friend. You too. Thank you.